Well, hello and welcome to our panel where we will discuss investment in women's sports today. My name is Thayer Laviel and I run The Collective, which is a division of Wasserman that is solely focused on creating change for equity and fairness for women in sports and entertainment. We look at this in a 360 degree way, starting with she as a consumer, fan, wealth owner, casual athlete and artist, pro athlete, um, and within and artists and within the industries we work. I really want to thank AT&T for their partnership with Clio Sports and specifically for the support of this panel. Okay, let's get to it. Today, I am joined by three leaders who are creating change for women and girls through their work in their industries. First up is Benita Fitzgerald Mosley, who serves as the head of community and impact and is the president of Fund Play for League Apps. In this role, Benita helps guide League Apps in its commitment to shape a youth sports industry centered by a core belief in the power of equitable sport. So important. Benita is a purpose-led champion in both sports and business, helping to create programs that support youth through sports and underserved communities. The former CEO of Loria Sport for Good Foundation and an Olympic gold medalist, in the 1984 games and the 100 meter hurdles. She has received many, many accolades, awards, and served in key leadership positions within sports and the Olympic movement. Welcome, Benita. Thank you, Thayer. Nice yeah. to be here. Yeah. Um, Kirta Carroll is uh, currently the vice president at Foot Locker, North America general Man merchandising manager uh, for their women's division and women's line bringing over 15 years of experience to this position. She has also worked in fashion and retail, healthcare and hospitality. Kirta was so instrumental in launching the original 602, which was Foot Locker's standalone women's brand for, se for several years. Today though, she takes the work, of, work to heart of serving women everywhere with better and cooler kicks in her new role, which focuses on product strategy, creation and development across the North American organization. So, ladies out there watching, when you go into Foot Locker and love what you see, you have Kirta and team to thank. So, welcome, Kirta. Thanks for having me. And lastly, please help me welcome Sabina Ahmed, who currently serves as at and Sponsorships and Experiential Group Lead, which includes partnerships with the NBA, WNBA, U.S. Soccer, and NCAA. They also present key events like the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, at and Byron Nelson, and the Tribeca Film Festival, as well as athlete partnerships like Sue Bird and Alex Morgan, among many others. A 20-year veteran in the media and marketing space, Sabina has always been a strong proponent and advocate for reaching and promoting underrepresented voices. Welcome, Sabina. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Happy to be here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here, too. This is such an important topic. So there's so much um, said about women, you know, women today, and there's so much momentum around women and women in sports. Um, but I wanted just to first start with a little table setting around women as consumers. You know, women are driving 85% of household spend, controlling 89% of all banking decisions in the U.S., and two-thirds of the wealth in this country will be owned by women in the next decade. Couple that with young women outpacing men on earning college degrees and even taking in the taking of jobs, not necessarily in pay yet, but um, hopefully we'll find some real equity there. There is seems to be a wholesale shift of economic power that's made marketers, I think, and I'm curious to hear from you guys, stop and think about how they need to reframe themselves to a very powerful and, quite frankly, socially discerning consumer. Women also make up, on average, 48 percent of a sports fan base, with younger generations becoming more fluid in their approach to fandom, watching it on the go in snippets, loyal to athletes and maybe some teams, but could be athlete first. Big shifts are happening in the space. How do we make sense of it all? So I want to first dive in um, and obviously want this to be a conversation where, um, you know, as I address one question, please jump in and, and participate if you have a, an opinion on it. Um, but I wanted to start off, Kirta, with you. You know, Foot Locker has long been actively invested in supporting women. Why and how do they do that? Yeah, I mean, I think great question, Thayer. You you know set it up sort of directionally with just the the power of the female purchaser, and I think you know certainly that's that's one part of it. But two, I think the overall just inclusion, right, and who is who is driving, um, you know, the consumer marketplace today. Uh, how do we make sure that she feels like she's part of sort of this bigger, massive industry that that certainly I would say from a true sneaker culture perspective, and again, not to 
go too deep in history, right, has has never really been about her, right? The creation for her, the storytelling for her. Um, I think she's always been there. She's always wanted to be a part of it, but it hasn't necessarily been directed at her. And I think this is just the time where everyone has sort of been catching up, is focused on catching up and fo focusing on committing, um, you know, someone that has always wanted to participate um, and they're understanding the true value. So I think the why is that it should have been there all along, I guess, right? Because she has, it's not like she hadn't wanted to purchase or had the, the income to purchase. But certainly just doing what we, we should from a sort of an inclusive perspective. I think the how it's in many ways following a formula that, it, that has existed in the, the industry, right? It's around ideas for her. Sometimes she requires a little bit of a different development of a of a of a, a shoe model right so caught a last in the industry right but how do you make sure it fits her foot um storytelling for her so celebrating things that matter to her in a, in a, in a way that's relevant to the female consumer connecting and, and i think lifting up other females is is very important to the female consumer so bringing her into the industry in new ways whether it's through athletes through it's it's through musicians through culture and i think really bringing it full circle again i think the the interesting thing, it's not that hard. It just maybe hasn't necessarily been a focus because the industry has been pretty big without her. Well, now uh, marketers have every uh, reason, literally, to pay attention from a fiscal and economic perspective to start to pay attention more. Mm -hmm. um, Sabina, what, you know, from AT&T has been pretty heavily invested in the gender equality space um, and has thrown a lot of weight and resources behind that. And um, from really from the top of the company to, you know, in store. And so what is behind AT&T's decision to go all in on, on women, particularly in sports as fans, players, leagues and teams? Yeah, absolutely. Thea. And that's a great question. And, you know, from a partnership perspective, investing in women in sports and women in sports sponsorships makes a lot of business sense. Um, traditionally, these types of opportunities and sponsorships are very accessible and come at an, in, in very easy and sort of turnkey way that can that many brands of different statures can work with them, right, and allows us to be nimble, to be creative and do a lot of great groundbreaking things. Um, this is really a sort of a no brainer right, to Kirta's point for us to be there. It's actually very easy to do. Um, and partners like the WNB as an example, actually make it really a, a great opportunity for us to, to get creative, right? And really co-create these opportunities together. Um, it's really very much in the at and ethos to support women across all endeavors. And the work we've done really and continue to do really challenges the conventional norms of sponsorships across, you know, going from sort of more traditional media to doing things differently and reaching them in different ways and unique ways. So a great example of that is really our partnership with the WNBA. Uh, across kind of, you know, from a league perspective, as well as the work we're doing with the Changemakers organization. Um, and obviously this kind of came at the heels of uh, the partnership with the NBA overall, but we wanted to make sure that this, was, this wasn't just an add-on. This was truly a standalone marquee partnership for us. Um, and as we built this partnership, we asked ourselves key questions of, you know, can we work on innovative ideas together? Can we do things differently and creatively? Can we really create an environment for women and athletes to tell their stories in an authentic way. And the WNBA really kind of came through and we're very excited about, you know, since our partnership and our inception in 2019. And, you know, just to, to hit upon a few key points, uh, when we first started our partnership, we did a lot of key, I would say, firsts in, in the industry. We were the first non-apparel brand to be on all 12 team jerseys since the inception, inception in 2019. In the, in the pandemic year in 2020, when the WNBA draft had an opportunity for their broadcast to be covered on ESPN instead of ESPN2, we were actually a strong proponent of that and we pushed for that to happen. We were there with support and put our money where our mouth was to make sure that we're actually investing from a media perspective and a marketing perspective to truly support right the WNBA draft. As a result, we saw some great um, numbers, right? The viewership went up 123% year over year and was the second most covered uh, and, uh, draft uh, of all time uh, from a WNBA perspective. Uh, we were also uh, a strong proponent, right? And one of the, the inaugural partners of the WNBA Changemakers, when they approached us uh, last year with this partnership, we, we saw it as a natural fit and we joined in right away and wanted to make sure that we obviously take that kind of partnership to the next level 
level. Uh, and as part of that, we bring in a lot of at t resources uh, to the table from the welcome video where we brought in other athletes um, as well as fans and our own leadership to kind of welcome them. We provided them with a special gift with a brand new 5G device uh, as well as uh, you know, a one year of AT&T wireless service, a year of AT&T HBO, uh, HBO Max subscription. We continue that uh, that sort of uh, partnership through this season as well. And then finally, you know, we continue to make sure that we are, again, going beyond just sort of a, um, a business partnership to creating opportunities for women and athletes to give them access to our business services and create opportunities for them to connect with each other. So we've created a five part panel series, bringing other women leaders in other industries and connecting them with the, with WNBA athletes. Uh, so bringing in, you know, Charlotte Jones, uh, bringing in, you know, a Taylor Rooks, making sure that they are strong women are connecting with other strong women to really cr truly create a great environment and sort of help and support each other. Um, well, congratulations on the, all that. I do think that you guys are leading the charge in many ways from a brand perspective in relation to league, pushing leagues and media companies to be more bold um, in their gender equality quest. So congratulations on that. Benita, I want to shift gears a little bit because where you play is really in youth sports, which is so important because we can't grow fans of sport without the top of the funnel and having more girls play sports. What are you seeing from an engagement perspective that, you know, what are the challenges that we're facing as we're coming out of this pandemic, particularly, I'm sure um, girls and their participation is taking a bit of a hit. And how do we support, you know, the investment into that top of the funnel in terms of engagement from a, from a sports perspective? Yeah, you know, with uh, with youth sports, I know, Kirta, you were saying that uh, when you're trying to connect to the female consumer in particular, connecting to things that they really care about is really important. And so, you know, as we face the challenges coming out of the pandemic and certainly kids uh, in underserved communities, girls and women have, we've seen a, a definite shift and, and a decrease in their participation in sport throughout the pandemic. And there, in many cases, those organizations are the slowest to come back. And so um, at League Apps, we, we have been, since its inception, a sponsor of the Play Sports Coalition, which is a, a, a coalition of 4,000 youth sports organizations across the country. And, um, you know, we're going to reemerge soon with an amazing 18-person board, which includes Laura Dixon from the Pro Sports okay. Assembly and, and others. Um, and, and the mission of the organization is to really find a united, uh, bring a united industry in support of the organizations who need it most and, and ensuring that all kids have access to play. And so, um, you know, the infrastructure for the plays movement includes, you know, wanting to increase that access to provide participation metrics and show a correlation between that participation and the wonderful benefits that kids and uh, youth participating uh, enjoy and making sure those benefits of youth sport uh, that accrue to these kids, uh, whether it's education or social emotional development, uh, self-confidence and awareness and goal setting. Uh, some, some things are very tangible, some things are intangible, but all help these kids be successful both on and off the playing field. And so um, we, we want to use, uh, you know, this coalition uh, and these ideas to champion the successes that we really have seen thus far. We helped to get the New York mobile sports betting uh, bill passed. And however you feel about mobile sports betting, the good news was we got uh, $5 million a year from the taxes from mobile sports betting designated to uh, youth sports organizations, particularly those nonprofits serving kids in underserved communities. So, you know, having the business community rally behind the Play Sports Coalition, whether it's either nationally or even locally and regionally, is going to really help to support and foster a really vibrant path forward for girls, but for youth as a whole. Yeah, well, congrats on all that success. And that's, you know, we'll take the investments however we can. Yeah. <laughs> so, good work there. Um, I wanted to turn a little bit to just women's sports in general, because we've talked about the fan of sports who is a woman and um, how we 
look at serving them overall. But women's sports, look, I feel like there's been great momentum around the conversation with women's sports, lots of great increases in viewership. Um, I would say that at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone thought this is it. Women's sports are going to be dead on the vine. That's, you know, there's no more investment. And lo and behold, women's sports were the ones to actually lead because they've been leading through tough times because they've always been in challenging times as a women's sport um, to get everybody through. So they led with the first virtual draft with the WNBA. They led with the first bubble with the NWSL. They led with tons of social justice stuff at the um, WNBA in the wobble. So I really feel like they have led um, and they have seen huge momentum coming out of last year. Viewership gains, merchandise gains, sponsorship gains, more brand commitments, $100 million by Michelob Ultra, um, you know, Budweiser coming in big and strong on stuff. Lots of lots of great um, partners coming in. So, Sabina, I wanted to talk a little bit with you about, you know, you had mentioned um, earlier in your in your response around how you guys had helped to push move a game from ESPN2 to ESPN, which I'm sure a lot of our um, WNBA partners would have liked to have seen uh, the other week in the uh, playoffs. Um, how how specifically are you pushing the envelope with your partners on demanding, dis, you know, kind of better distribution? And like, how do we encourage other brands to do that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there it's not it's obviously not just one entity that can push for it. Right. It's part of like a larger ecosystem. And I think, Benita, you touched upon this as well. Every uh, every major part of different organizations have to play a role in this, right? So it can't just be me as an advertiser and as a brand pushing for it. We have to have the broadcasters meet us in the middle and the league partners as well. So all of us have to kind of work together to make sure that we're truly representing women the right way and putting support, right, and investment behind it. Uh, that means definitely calling on our media company partners, right, to give more airtime. To the leagues and and women and athletes and the example of WNBA draft is a good one. We have, there's a lot more we have to do because those inequities still exist today. So we are continuing to push the envelope and we have to obviously put more support behind it as we do. Um, but we want obviously other companies to come along with us and having a partner like See Her See Her in Sports as well as the collective I think allows us to kind of uh, pool all these resources together, work with other advertisers and brands so we can all kind of push through and make sure that we make those things happen and it won't come it won't come right away the change it'll take some time right to to build that sort of momentum and we've got great use cases like the WNBA draft as an example to kind of help push it if you build it you know people and the audiences will come you just have to kind of start from somewhere so we're we're kind of really excited about the opportunity and kind of building on what Benita said having kind of partnerships like her time to play with the WNBA kind of allows us to start at a, at, a, at a younger age, right? And making sure that we're creating the opportunities for young women and girls to engage with one another um, so that they can start to see themselves in the future, put the money behind it, put the support behind it, and then also create the tools and uh, avenues for young women and girls to communicate with each other, to have the tools to see themselves right. in the future will really kind of go a long way. So. It is, it is actually, it seems very easy, but it requires a lot of momentum and a lot of different entities working together to make it happen. Yeah, we like to say the flywheel is broken in many different spokes, right? So like they all need help and not there's not one of us that's going to solve it alone. So Absolutely. I think to that point, we all need to lean in. Benita, um, as a former Olympian and, and knowing the success of women athletes this Olympic Games in Tokyo, um, how, like, what would you advise companies, organizations to do to keep up the momentum and messaging around women's sports, because that really affects your your key constituents, which are youth and how yeah. they're looking up to their heroes, particularly with kind of the influx of the athlete as hero these days, correct? Yes. I mean, if you can see it, you can be it. And so seeing the women in Tokyo on the world stage competing at the highest levels and, and being successful. Those are the kinds of things that always um, inspire more girls. I was inspired myself to participate in uh, athletics. It was first gymnastics. And if you could see me in real life, I'd be 5'10", and not necessarily the 4'10", that <laughs> most of the gymnasts are. So, um, but I was inspired by Nadia Kamenich. I saw her in the Olympic Games. I thought she was cool. I went out for the gymnastics team in my middle school. And 
thankfully that gymnastics coach uh, put me on the team, but she was also the track coach. And she just kind of redirected me just a little bit uh, away from gymnastics and into track and field. And thank God she did that. Apparently um, it paid off for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, strong, strong redirection. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, yesterday uh, was Carly Lloyd Day in New Jersey. And, you know, there were boys and girls of every age there. Um, they're going to build a home field, uh, a soccer field in her honor. They're going to, you know, that will allow her legacy to last, you know, long past her playing days on the national team or in the W, uh, in the in the women's soccer league. And so, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that we need. We need to keep these women athletes' presence in the public eye, whether it's through marketing or social media or um, other other means. Um, but as an industry, we've got to keep the momentum going. We've got to continue to invest in women's sports, whether it's media rights, content partnerships, and, um, you know, new companies entering the mix. I was looking at um, uh, Allison Felix's new uh, company called Sage. They just unveiled their new headquarters in California. I'm so proud of her. She's an athlete I've known since she was in high school, uh, the most decorated Olympian uh, track and field athlete in, in history. And we're, we're really proud of her, but she's she's doing something herself. I think athletes have some ownership in this to to find ways to keep keep their momentum going and keep their their names and um, and businesses in the public eye. Um, and, you know, at, at League Apps, we we think it's important too. we we just we have several uh, female investors. I talked about Laura Dixon earlier, but Swin Cash and Julie Fowley are among our, our female investors. So athletes need to find other ways if you want to. You know, if you want to influence uh, business, the best way to do is get involved in it yourself as an investor, as an owner, uh, as a supporter, endorser of the business. And so there are many ways, I think, that athletes can do it, but I think that a lot falls on corporations as well. Yeah, um, I think that's right. And, and I also would look at um, how do we as corporations uh, and, and those agencies that work with these corporations continue to push and uh, push people to just be more intentional in their inclusivity and in their choices as to how they direct their business. And so it could be the smallest, most subtle things as to analyzing what your spend is, men's to women's, what your um, activation budget is, who you hire, not only within your own team, but within your influencer team or within your production staff. Um, just uh, to the, the Olympic movement uh, started Olympic. doing that a few years ago. And not only what you uh, see on the playing field, certainly bringing that parity as to the number of women's sports, women's events, all of that, and finding that parity. As soon as they started doing that, guess what? On the U.S. team in 2012 was the first year that more women than men were on the Olympic team. More women won medals than men. And so when when you give us that, that, that uh, opportunity, we're going to rise to the occasion. That's right. That's amazing. Kirta, shifting gears really quickly, because this is a really important point, and I'm, I might put you on the spot just for a second. When you look at what's being sold in stores, not just Foot Locker, but just retailers in general, there's so many amazing um, options for um, exercise apparel, like, you know, yoga pants or running shorts or whatever. There's tons and tons of great stuff out there as a woman fan of a men's sport. There's not so much on the women's fan of a women's sport or it just a fan of a woman's sport, men or a woman. Um, I'm hoping that we see that turn around someday soon. Do you anticipate that coming to be? Because I do feel like the villagers are getting restless on this one. Yeah, I mean, I think it actually plugs in really nicely to the conversation because it is sort of this evolution, right? And I think the responsibility of of the culture and the consumer and the athlete and the the brands to, to make sure we push that forward. And I would say traditionally it's not been there. I think the stage example is a great one. I think obviously Allison's done an amazing job bringing that to life. And I think even what I love about what she's doing too, is it's become this bigger platform to celebrate athletes, celebrate the female. I think what she did from a, being a mother too, and sort of opening up some of the things she personally was dealing with uh, uh, through her journey um, and, and making sure she could do what she wanted from an athletic perspective, but also be a mom, be present, and then support the next generation, I think gave it this this much bigger platform that I think athletes needed to reach from a female perspective. And I would say that's part of it is that from a traditional perspective, I think the male athlete has been 
dimensionalized outside of sport, right? They are style icons. They are um, speaking out around political and cultural opportunities. And, and obviously the female is, is there, but I don't know that we've been able to give her that sort of platform to, to celebrate her and say, look at, she's an important figure for us and a, an important figure to celebrate. And also I want to be like her, right? Not just on the court. Like, I don't want to just like play a sport like her, but I want to be Allison Felix because she is a amazing mom and, and doing amazing things for the community. And I think that all is sort of part of the conversation we need need to keep have, have, having in order to, to move it forward, even from a, a commercial side, which is funny to connect the dots, but it ultimately is, is celebrating these female athletes outside of their court or their their sport or their very specific moment. And I think, again, I think we're getting there. And obviously there's been tremendous conversation around the Olympics and in, in, in many other sports in the, in the last, I would say, many years, but it, it's still something we all need to work on and, and be comfortable doing that. Yeah, thanks. I, I could not agree more with you on that. I, I also think from an athlete perspective, um, you know, we've seen a lot of um, at Wasserman and the collective, a lot of athletes, obviously, uh, coming into their own with their own voice and social media has given them the platform to be able to do this in a whole new way. Um, and some of that might be great for some athletes, others might not really want or feel as comfortable in that, which I can fully appreciate as someone is probably falls into the latter side of that, um, just as a regular old human. Um, but how do we, you know, Benita, I guess I'll start with you. How do you look at the dimensionality of women and the complexity? Allison's a great example of this. Um, we can look at Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka, with so many stories that are just human of late coming to the forefront around mental health, around women's health, around their safety with all this NWSL um, uh, you know, issues going on. How does Fund Play support young women and girls to create a safer environment? And how do we as an industry go in and help continue this conversation, quite frankly, unabashedly? You know, women are multidimensional uh, humans. And, you know, most of us are playing uh, a variety of roles in our lives in a, in a very high level. I think uh, I called it all my life. I'm a mom. I'm a wife of 25 years. My oldest is 22. My, my daughter's 17. Um, I have two seniors, uh, one in high school, one in college. Um, and so I've been a mom and a CEO and a a uh, board member and an athlete and a wife, obviously, and a sister and a, a daughter. And so bringing all of those personas, I think as Kirta was saying, to the forefront in advertising and storytelling, I think is the thing that people, you, we want those women to see themselves reflected back through these, through these athletes and these icons. And um, part of that is this idea around mental health and uh, and that goes to obviously the the physical, emotional abuse that that some of these athletes have unfortunately had to endure. And I know this is true in, in the corporate setting. It's true uh, in in Hollywood in some cases, in music business. Many industries have have fought this um, themselves. The the Me Too movement is is certainly um, reflective of that. In uh, at League Apps, we we have uh, partners that we call. Um, uh, we call it League Apps Connect, but they're integration partners, and they're able to provide uh, the kinds of um, background checks and training and education and technology that people need in order to fuel and make make these environments more uh, more safe. Um, you know, that that's important in 2021, 2022, that you can weave uh, technology into helping this. Uh, people have better access to this training. They have better access to the tools that they need uh, to track uh, individuals that that may have had a um, a challenge in the past, uh, and so to make sure they don't get back into the coaching ranks or uh, around those young people. And so, uh, Players Health is is one of our integration partners, and they've consistently shown us and their customers how to accomplish this. Uh, holistically, like I said, through education and training and technology, uh, the background checks, it's so important. It's more than just checking a cut box. You've got to make sure that you're you're creating the safe environment, you're maintaining the safe environment, and that parents like myself can entrust the organization um, with, with your athlete and with their children. 
Yeah, in, in many ways, it's providing the youth sports sector the tools to be able to um, account for and hold hold other people accountable to, Absolutely. to their behavior and also make sure that just fundamentally the kids are having fun doing what they're doing. Yeah. Right? That's first and foremost. That's first and should be first and foremost. Exactly. Um, Sabina, tell me a little bit about what or tell us all a little bit about She's Connected and, and what AT is, NT is doing there, because it's a really quite a powerful campaign that you guys have created and particularly for the players that are involved. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this really builds nicely off of what both Benita and Kira mentioned earlier is, uh, you know, the multidimensional nature of women and uh, and women athletes is that it's it's not about just talking about what they're doing in the sport that they're engaging in. It's they have so many different lives outside of that. So it's important to make sure that we shed light on that. So as we developed the at and She's Connected program, it was important for us to sort of flip the model on its head and not just look at sort of a logo place or are brought to you by at and but truly create an environment where we allow um, these uh, female athletes to tell their stories, which may or may not go beyond that the sport the sport that they're engaging in. So working with Chine Ogumike, Alex Morgan, uh, Maria Fassi, uh, Sue Bird, we gave them the microphone, right, and allowed them to tell their stories, uh, which really ranged from, you know, their life and in, in the sport that they're engaging in, as well as, you know, their, their lives outside, the causes that they promote, how they, their, their second jobs, their careers outside of the sports, as well as, you know, the foundation that they're creating for future generations, which is very important to each and every one of them. Uh, so beyond sort of obviously creating the awareness and uh, behind these amazing and captivating videos, we actually uh, offer for each of these athletes, at t business services, and made sure we gave them opportunity for mentorship and how to create and kind of grow their sort of social following and their social programs. Stay tuned for more. We're actually very, very excited about the next phase of what we're doing around um, She's Connected and moving beyond even kind of sports as well. So really excited about the next uh, generation of what uh, at t She's Connected will bring to the table and we'll share more as that program evolves. Well, very exciting. We'll be on pins and needles waiting for that. Um, Kirta, I wanted to see in our last remaining minutes here what your thoughts are just around, you know, as someone that's really worked across the sector, uh, particularly in retail, but um, in, in the sports world, I would say, for many years. What is your parting advice for brands and agencies listening in? And, and really, how can we all just be better stewards of gender equity? I mean, I again, I think the really nice alignment from this conversation today is that it's responsibility of many. And I think it's responsibility of the brands of the athlete. And I would, I would also say it's responsibility of the consumer to say, I'm going to invest in these things and because it's important to the, the future. Um, and, you know, certainly taking that on a, a, as I look forward, but I think sometimes the, we we're going to have to think ahead of the curve, right. And, you know, maybe the commercial opportunity isn't necessarily there always today, uh, from a, a female athlete perspective or a sport perspective, because again, I think it's it's a shift in culture, and I have to tell a story I'm not proud of, but it's it's true. Is that I have a seven year old son, and three years ago we were watching the women's uh, we were at a restaurant in the NCAA uh, basketball tournament. Women were playing basketball, and my son goes, "Wait, women can play basketball?" <laughs> he was four at the time, right? And and I was caught off guard, and I felt terrible about it. But then I thought to myself it's not me, right? Like it's not, I'm not telling him that doesn't happen. We live in New York city, right? He sees people everywhere playing basketball, but the culture of basketball wasn't necessarily forefront from a women's perspective. Right. And I think that's where it's, we all have to elevate it. We have to give her maybe more share of voice than we have been, give her a platform, understand, uh, you know, the dimension of the human and, and the, the female and, and lift her up in different ways. And I think just maybe think a little bit differently. So it's a, it's a little bit about charting our new ways, but also be all in on it together, right? And be committed to it because even more important than that, the sort of long-term nature of the athlete, I think it, it is about the younger generation and just how important sport is needed to the sort of development of, of being a, a, a leader in the future. So not a lot of advice, but I think we just, we just all got to be in it together. I love that. I love that concept. And I love that, um, you know, we're, uh, what I see is that the younger generations also, and it makes me sound very old when I say that I don't mean it that way, but like they're going to ask for what they want anyway. So we saw it last NCAA women's tournament. They, they demanded equality, which is pretty unbelievable. 
um, and were supported in that pretty loudly. Uh, so there was a, a bit of a revolution happening there. Benita, same question goes to you. Um, if parting advice, I mean, you're really, again, kind of sitting at this, at this space where, you know, kids are coming in and feeling excited about sports. How do you, how do you keep them in there? How do you make sure that they stay, that women and, and or I should say girls stay in to keep going? Gosh, you know, I, I see myself, my, my daughter is in the, in the college application mode and she wrote this wonderful essay. Um, she was assigned to write one from her English teacher, but uh, it, it was to prepare them to use it in the Common App or for whatever. And she decided to, to kind of hold myself and my mom up as role models mm -hmm. and how she wants to follow in our footsteps as a strong wife and mother and leader um, in the medical field. Uh, you know, charting her own path because neither one of us are in the medical field, but, but inspired by us to, to do and emulate what we've done. And so I'll go back to the phrase I said before, if I can see it, I can be it. And, you know, she, she said, mommy, read this and edit it for me or something like that. Well, gosh, of course I was in complete, it was right. just for yeah. Clemson, I guess. Right. 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 No better word than that. Mm -hmm. uh, just tears. But she said, I didn't want to make you cry. I was like, yeah, but you did. Yeah. Um, and so, good night. yeah, yeah. And it, it really is so important if they can see uh, these female athletes, these icons, if they if they're front and center, if we're sharing these stories, that's the important thing. You know, if we have the the products and and um, you know things that Foot Locker is putting out, that, those are the things that are really important because uh, as these girls come up and as they're playing, if they see these role models and they know they have lives and they're leaders off the court as well, it's that leadership that leaves a legacy uh, that's going to inspire the next generation. That's beautiful. And um, I think we'd all be curious to read that wonderful essay that your daughter read. So you should publish it afterwards. Um, yeah. yeah, you should, because I think we all need inspiration. And I, I would also argue that it's not just athletes that have that role. It's also all of us in these seats in business that have the role to really uh, lean down and mentor and sponsor women who are coming up through the ranks to make sure that they're getting getting all the room to fly that they can. Sabina, I'm going to close it out with you. Give us some wisdom. Throw it down for us. Absolutely. And, you know, just building off of what both Benita and Kirta shared, it really is everyone has a role to play. So uh, I can control what I can, right? So as a, as a brand and an advertiser, I want to make sure we push ourselves and our partners to continue to support and invest in women in sports. That's basically table stakes for us. It's kind of the theme of, uh, of this day is making sure everyone has a part to play. Uh, organizations and athletes likewise. Um, and really at the, at the core of it is we have to all embrace diversity from within. We've got to become a company that represents the society and the culture and the sponsorships, right? And the opportunities will follow. If we can sort of uh, mirror what the world looks like today as organizations, then the opportunities for women with, will, will easily unlock. It really is very simple. So let's let's kind of be be the be the uh, the organizations that we're trying to sort of like reach out for. Uh, and then finally, like I think we shouldn't be shying away from the opportunity to tell these sort of different types of unique stories. Uh, the multidimensional nature of women, you know, women of color, women of color in the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. women um, that are athletes and moms. We can't um, you know, shy away from allowing them to tell those different stories uh, and life outside of the sports that they live in. It's important. And if we do, if we do shy away, we will leave the opportunity on the table for the future of young girls, right, to see themselves as yeah, and it's sort of like the future careers that they're choosing. So it's important for us to make sure that we embrace any and all aspects of the multidimensional nature of women and athletes and the and the lives they live outside of the uh, of the sports they engage in. Indeed, and I think that will take continued effort on all of our parts and then some. So, uh, ladies, it has been such a pleasure speaking with you guys today. I feel like we could go on for a three-day summit here, but um, <laughs> there's just so much to dive into. But I really appreciate the time and the wisdom. Um, and thank you again to Clio Sports for having us here today and to at and for being such a great partner to Clio Sports in this. Thank you so much, ladies. Thanks for thank having us. Thank you for having us.